Hey guys, my name is Nick. I'm a Microsoft Certified Expert Administrator. I create a lot of content for MSPs. And in today's video, I'm going to be covering the attack surface reduction rules from Microsoft Defender ATP, recently renamed to Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. That just happened a couple weeks ago, so if you guys want, update your own internal documentation because when you're searching for it, it will be reflected in the new name in the coming months here. Before I get started, if you guys want to watch any content related to MSPs and the new updates from Microsoft, get product demos, see how they can be integrated into your PSA tools, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Getting into it here, I'm going to be covering, as far as the demo goes, a couple of these features that come part of the attack surface reduction rules that are part of Defender ATP. A couple of these here, I'll walk through the actual configuration of the policy in the Endpoint Manager Admin Center, and then we'll see that in real time on a device as well. Lots of these settings here come with the OS, as in the Windows 10 operating system. You just have to enable the controls and assign them to a group in order for them to take effect, and that's where you can get into some of the reporting. So. I'll be demoing that, seeing it real time, and then showing you what you see in the Security Center as well, too. For the attack surface reduction rules, these are some of the controls that I'll go through here, uh, but they really relate to a lot of different things in your environment. But they're making sure you are proactive in certain things. But one key thing is they are showing you the scope of user impact, which I find highly valuable, which we'll see here in a second but they include things like the macros that can come from office apps and the child processes they create. It can come from the scripting rules or email rules, and they really are helping you become more proactive in these events, but also, again, high level, just reducing your attack surface. So getting into that here real quick, I wanted to pull up the center here. This is the Security Center, Microsoft Defender Security Center. And in here, you can see some of these rules by going under the Threat and Vulnerability Management section, going to Security Recommendations. And here, you'll see these Related Components section. You'll see that some of these are tagged with the parentheses of Attack Surface Reduction, which is ones we can pull up here. The cool part is, if you allow enough time to pass, it'll describe you the user impact. So it's saying that based off of the analysis from the past 45 days, you could set this on 40% of your exposed devices without impacting the users. So that's really cool to have in the sense of seeing what this is going to do to your end users before you just start turning things on and understanding how you can be proactive in communications for them as well too and seeing what you want to do with that as well too. So. These are some of the things that you can detect in this particular section and you can request a remediation for your team to go work on this and they can see this detail as well too. And so from here where you would go is the Endpoint Manager Admin Center. So I'll pop in there real quick. So in the Endpoint Ad Manager Admin Center, you're gonna go to Endpoint Security and here you'll click on Attack Surface Reduction and you'll go ahead and create a new policy. From here, we'll select Windows 10 or later, and down below you have a variety based off of the variety of features that are included here. And again, I'm not gonna go through all these, I'm just gonna cover web protection and the attack surface reduction rules, but I'll link documentation for the other ones as well too, so you can play around with those as well. So when you click on create here, it'll take you through these rules. You can name them, name this profile, whatever you like. And then for the configuration settings here, they show you a little bit of the detail and they show you a little blurb talking a little bit more about it as well. The coolest part here is that you can turn all these into audit mode initially, which is what I recommend doing, just so you can get some telemetry on what kind of scope you're looking at in the sense of turning these on and how it'll affect end users. Like it mentioned in the previous uh, admin center there, it is affecting 40% of the users on two devices. This, this environment doesn't have a large scope, um, but it is needed to understand what they are going to see so you just don't start blocking a lot of their processes and things like that. And so you can come in here and you can you know review all these rules and you can select these things to go into an audit mode and you'll be able to collect that telemetry and you'll be able to see how it's applied to their devices. 
Additionally, you can start to protect the uh, source folders as well too from outside applications being able to access those folders as well too. So you can whitelist these apps and these allowed app paths for the particular folders that you have in your environment. Because we moved into a space where you want to trust no apps until they earn your trust and they've been acting or uh, live in your environment in providing no malicious activity before you want the, to give them access to do certain things. This will also help you reduce shadow IT in certain cases as well too. So after you've done you know, your configuration here as far as everything that you're going to do, you would just simply go into the groups and you can apply it to all users and devices or you can scope it to certain groups if you wanted to do a certain pilot group. Again, if it's in all audit mode, it may not be applicable to just apply to a certain group and pilot. You may just want to use all users and devices and collect that telemetry. When you're done, you can click on review and create and that'll pull this up here. And so you'll begin to see shortly how it's applying to the users and devices in your environment here. And from there, you can com come back into the Microsoft Defender Security Center. And here, in, you can come down into the configuration management and you'll see the attack surface management. And I think Microsoft will clean this up in the future, but obviously you'll see me here popping around to man multiple management portals. I think they're looking to consolidate into the security center here. But the other thing that you can do after you're done is you can see the auditing only or blocking if you did scope it to different groups and you can see how it's being applied to these particular devices as well and who has these ones turned on and who has them turned off. So you just have additional reporting in here. And you can see the telemetry here as it begins in the sense of what's audited and what was blocked. So you can track this over time in here and periodically review the settings that you've applied, maybe to get more restrictive or to get less restrictive. It's causing a lot of productivity issues in the environment. So those are the, the attack surface reduction rules and viewing them um, in this particular portal. Going back into this particular section here, the other one we can create is rules for the web protection or network protection. And so I've already created one just for the sake of uh, this demo, just to show you what the end result looks like. But you can come in here to the properties after, you're, after the fact and see the configuration settings. And so what I'm doing here is I'm enabling network protection, requiring smart screen for Microsoft Edge, but also blocking malicious site access and blocking unverified file download. The big thing here is if you don't configure this setting, it only applies to Microsoft Edge out of the box. So the web protection settings apply their native graph, security graph API, machine learning capabilities to detect malicious phishing sites that you might click on in an email that try to pop up, things like that that are, are native to this without actually configuring a policy, but they apply mostly to Microsoft Edge and they don't apply to the other browsers. Um, so what this is doing is enabling across Firefox and Chrome as well too and allowing you to set up some custom indicators, which I'll get to here in a second as well as uh, some some of the content filtering that you can create so that it doesn't just apply to Microsoft Edge, it applies across all the, the client browsers. So this is a, a big one to set up here. I'd highly advise doing that. It does take quite a while um, for this to take effect in the sense of actually being able to test this fully. Microsoft touts about one hour, but in my experience, it was about two hours before this started really applying to the devices that were recently enrolled into the service. So going back into the security center here, the other big piece you want to do here is come down into the settings tab. And what you want to do first here is go on to advanced features and you'll want to turn on custom network indicators if it's not already on, it's off by default in the environment. So you'll want to turn this on and then from there, what you can do is go into the indicator section and you can decide to block or whitelist or get alerts on certain file hashes, certain IP addresses or certain URLs, domains or certificates. 
So I did a couple here to just show you what it looks like from an end user experience once these take effect. But you can add a new item here and you can define a specific URL. And the HTTPS designation doesn't really matter. Uh, I did both here, like you can see with Facebook, just to show that it doesn't really matter if you put that in or not. Um, but you can put any URL here and you could say something like edge.com. But the cool part here is you can see statistics on the end user activity if they're going uh, to this particular website or how what kind of impact they'll have. You can also have a custom date for this for some reason if you wanted to temporarily block something. And then you can allow people to do this so it's whitelisting it or you can get alerts or you can alert and block and you could define the alert title for this you can define the severity in the category and this is something where you know it's maybe uh, unwanted software it's command and control you can decide what this is and you can put it in a description and then you can scope it to certain users or all users in the environment for you to be able to scope this to if you do scope it to certain devices you can pick them one at a time or you can use your machine groups which you've set up here in the permission section. So just a couple different ways to do that, but I'll show you one that I've already set up. I've got the severity here picked and I've got all devices in my scope where I can choose to select from a list. And again, you have your device groups here, which you've defined under the permissions section. So a different couple of things here, you could go e even all the way to say that this is certain minor techniques as well um, but I didn't do that here so this is you know where you can see this information and when when this takes effect you can also begin to see the alerts um, or incidents that are derived from this or if it's been observed in your organization and which devices have caused that alert as well so in the case of looking at these I can pop into a test device here I can go to a new tab and I can just say facebook.com and it's immediately blocked um, here and it says administrator is blocking me from doing that. Same is true if I try to go to Reddit. And so these things take effect immediately. And additionally, if you have um, your, this is just a test malicious site here and you can try to connect here but it's again going to block you from doing so so that's just the native one without you actually defining what this looks like because it's, it's detecting malicious content from the secure graph api and it's also detecting the phishing attempts and things of that nature as well too the big thing though again because we set up that policy this can apply cross browser and so if i take this url and I go back to Chrome, I'll have the same content um, exposed, whereas if I didn't set up that policy, it would allow me to pass through into this site on Chrome or Firefox or another browser. So that's a big thing um, that you have to take into note there. Back in the Defender Security Center here, you can start to see once they come through, it probably takes about 10 minutes or so, you'll start to see these alerts that you created come through and the name here, the title reflects whatever you, you made on there. It also reflects the description that you made here as well too. So you can click into that to see the detection source and the settings that you defined and what device it was on. So all that's coming through for you as well as the suspicious connections as well too. So this is one where you can click into it and it'll go through the, the process tree here. So it'll show you, you know, what, what was blocked here, the URI in this case being that malicious URL that we put in and showing that it was it was blocked automatically from the network protection service that was in place. We can additionally see the whole alert story here as well too, in the sense of the child processes that were being executed and things like that. The other one last piece I wanted to look at here with you guys is the web content filtering. This is one where it's kind of confusing because Microsoft's documentation states that you have to have Windows 10 E5 in order to be able to consume this particular feature set. But I only have Microsoft Defender 
ATP standalone in Microsoft Business 365 Premium, Business Premium, and it's working just fine for me. It took some propagation time, many hours for this to start taking effect, but it is now. With the web content filtering here though, you can specify a name for this um, as, as far as whatever you want there. And then you can choose to block certain categories or high bandwidth, legal liability. They have their predefined ones here as well too. So you can choose to do this, but again, I'd be careful uh, just rolling it out to a broad audience at first. Be sure you are you know, checking this with a, a scoped audience at first for just basic testing and then rolling it out more so along with that, along a certain timeline. And so you can, you know, go all the way down until you do that. But I just picked this one. I picked adult content and leisure and I picked all the devices in my scope here as well. So if I go back to my test device, part of this is, um, you know, gambling. So I can just search for gambling. And let's just go to this online casino and I get blocked from Caesars games here. So again, it's, it's filtering, it's doing my content search, but technically with the licensing model, I shouldn't be able to do this. So that's the only part that's confusing, but it still worked in this environment. Again, M365 VP plus Microsoft Defender ATP standalone. So these are the main features that I wanted to, to show you guys in this particular video. You guys can check out a link to documentation like I mentioned for the other pieces of ASR. Just want to show you how to set up policies and showing them taking effect in there and being able to set up a custom indicator as well. After some time, they tout over 12 hours, you'll start to get telemetry here in the web protection section. I still haven't yet, and it's been over 12 hours since I applied that rule and have hit the gambling sites multiple times. So not sure fully, there might be just more delays in that, but I'll link it here below as well too, as soon as this comes through, just for your own information. That's everything I wanted to show for you guys in this video though. So if you have any questions or comments on ASR with Microsoft Defender for Endpoint or Microsoft Defender ATP, feel free to leave them below. Otherwise, like I mentioned before, like or subscribe to the channel if you guys want to see more content around Microsoft 365 and the MSP space. Thanks guys, have a great day.